uh, we we have some hopefully some good news for you guys. Uh, we're going to be talking all things money tonight. Uh, first, we have Dr. Kenny Burdine, who's going to talk to you about the market and uh, what his uh, prognostication is, hopefully, Kenny, on what we can expect uh, this coming spring and and maybe on a little further. I'm not sure how, how far of a reach you're going to take tonight. Uh, and then the, the, the second piece of good news is Dr. Lemcooler is going to tell you guys where you can find the cheap feed. Uh, I know that I, I'm interested to hear what that one is, too. Um, it, it, things have not looked good there, but uh, maybe everything's relative, too. We'll see what Dr. Lemcooler has to say. But, uh, Kenny, I, I think you should have the capability to share the screen. I'm going to turn it over to you. We do appreciate it. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Kenny Burdine from our Ag Economics Department, a uh, uh, long time now extension faculty member here at UK and does a fantastic job and always more than willing to help out the, the beef guys. So we appreciate it, Kenny, and I will turn it over to you. Good. Well, I appreciate it, Darren. Good to, good to be on as always. So. Thanks a bunch. Um, I will stop video just for the sake of bandwidth. I'm probably okay, but I, I will stop just to be safe. So we'll go from there and I'll jump back on video after we're done. But just very quickly, I wanted to walk through some general market stuff. And I will give you kind of what I'm going to call my planning prices for, for 2023. And I will talk about spring, summer, I'll even talk about fall, kind of for both calves and heavy feeders. And Biggest thing, though, I just want to talk through some things that I think are driving this market. So I've, I've planned probably 15 minutes of material here. And I'm going to listen to listen to Dr. Lynn Cooler, and I'll be glad to stick on and visit with anybody afterwards like we, like we typically do. First thing I want to say is that the supply picture has changed a great deal. And I'll talk about the supply picture of live cattle in a little bit. But I want to focus first kind of on the beef side and kind of look at the right you know, right column there, we're going to see an increase in pork production. We're going to see an increase in roller production. We're going to see a pretty significant drop in beef production. Um, I've got a star by the 5% because that's my estimate. The other the other two were ERS, but um, I actually pulled back ERS has dropped a little bit. I can't get quite as low for 2023 as they do unless I assume quite a bit of heifer retention, which I don't think we're going to see. But bottom line is we're going to be a lot tighter supplies of beef at the retail level just due to production this coming year. And that brings me to this next question. And it's one of the one of the common questions I'll get when I talk to producers out in the state. And I, I really do enjoy doing that. But we'll talk about cattle markets and someone will say something to the effect of, you know, should I be concerned that beef cattle price, or sorry, that beef prices get so high folks back away? And economists view that differently than a lot of other people. But as an economist, you know, you view prices as, as a reflection of supply. And by that, I mean, at the micro level, we go to the grocery store and we look at price and that dictates what we buy. If you think about it, though, kind of from the entire beef system perspective, there's a given amount of beef that's produced that kind of becomes supply. And then based on what it takes to move all that meat through the system, that's kind of the prices we see at the retail level. Now, the point that I wanted to make here, if you look kind of the right side of the chart that I'm showing you, you know, you, you'll see obviously high prices for all meats across the board. But what's a little bit hard to tell is that if you kind of look at the ratio, in other words, beef is the, you know, beef's the blue line, pork is the red line, and bellors are kind of that, that dark blue or, or black line. On a relative basis, beef prices actually haven't gained as much as pork or poultry. So if you think about a ratio, in other words, the ratio of retail beef price to the other two meats is actually lower than it has been. So I just say that because I think it's important to understand that there's some room probably for beef prices to increase in 2023, because in reality, they're priced largely based on what we see in the, the pork and poultry sector. Um, just very, very quickly on fed cattle prices, you know, kind of during COVID, our fed cattle market had gotten down about a dollar a pound. And we're on that 158 to 159 range right now. So we've added several hundred dollars ahead of the value of fed cattle at the national level here in the last, you know, 24 months or so. <coughs> The real story in 2022, though, is what I'm showing in front of you right now. This is drought monitor. On your left, I grabbed kind of the, you know, the mid-July time period. 
on your right, I grabbed, grabbed kind of that late October time period. But in 2021, the drought was concentrated mostly in the far west of the northern plains. And the way I kind of described it coming into this past summer, it's almost like I took that drought and I rotated clockwise about 90 degrees. So we moved it into the southern plains and you'll see certainly Texas, Oklahoma, that area, a whole lot of cows in this area. As we move through fall, I apologize for the cough, bro. I was feeling fine until I got up here. Um, and we, we've moved more to the southeast this fall. Now, obviously, we've had some rain the last couple months, but I, I'm focusing right now on what I'm showing is going on through the, the bulk of our forage production season. So in reality, what we had, we had the perfect storm for liquidation. We had dry weather in a lot of the U.S., a lot of major cattle producing states. We had high input prices, which really go back to pre Pre drought, we're talking spring, thinking about fertilizer price, high fuel prices, feed price. Obviously, Jeff's going to talk about it some. And then, really, we had some really good cold cow prices. What I'm showing you here, red line is 2022. I'm showing you the 80 to 85% boning cows. But in the summer, when you know those cows tend to be in better condition, we had a lot of you know decent looking cold cows selling for a dollar a pound or more. So we, we had some strong cold cow markets on top of everything else. So we moved a lot of cattle. Um, if you just look at 2022 versus the year ago, and I always kind of like to look at things as a comparison to the previous year for, for the sake of discussion, we actually slaughtered almost 400,000 more beef cows, reproducing females, beef cows, in 2022 than 2021. And I would remind you that beef cow herd got smaller in 2021, too. This is a big difference, and keep in mind this is you know this is on a cow herd that was less than thirty million cows. So the real story we start thinking about you know beef cow inventory, and you know, January thirty first USDA USDA released their estimates of our the size of our beef cow herd. I always focus mostly on beef cow numbers, but. They estimated us down three and a half percent, and um, you had to kind of look for it. But well, what they also did, they went back and they made a downward revision to 2022. So bottom line is compared to where we thought we were last year versus where we started out this year, down about four percent. Now, I like to look at things a little bit longer term, and I think this may tell the story better. But we're down almost three million cows from where we were in 2019. So I'm pointing right now to 2019. That's that's going to, that is the the high point, if you will, of this particular cattle cycle. And we've seen you know we've seen several years of liquidation. We're down roughly nine percent from that high that we were at in 2019. I said this same thing back in 14 and 15, but this is the smallest the cow herd has been since 1962. Now we're more productive than we were then, of course. But the fact that we're down below 2014 levels to me is significant. I think it's important to think about um, head for retention still down. What this means, big picture, is supply is going to be much tighter. We expected this, but this kind of confirmed that. And it really is going to shift a lot of leverage back to the feeder cattle market and the cow calf sector. And, you know, we've seen a lot of that. The last two or three weeks, these calf markets have really moved. And we're going to see more of that as we get closer to grass, like we typically do seasonally. Um, I'm going to talk just really quickly about current cattle prices. And again, I'm, I'm showing you state average. All right. So on your left, I'm showing you what I kind of call my heavy feeders. This is an 850 pound, medium and large frame, number one, two steer. State average, he's been in the 160s. Groups, value added, you know, cattle, upper 160s, pushing 170. A lot more movement here on the right-hand side. Um, just comparing January to the first two weeks I've got thus far in February, 550-pound steer calf is about 10 cents a pound higher. But to tell the story of the run better, to me, it's easier to think almost where were we early January, where were we last week, and up about 20 cents. We were in the up, we were in the mid to upper 170s that when we kind of opened back in 2023. That steer calf stayed average last week, averaged about $1.95. And if you followed any of these groups, some of the value-added calves that moved through markets, we had a lot of these five weights north of $2, some, some $2.05 to $2.15. So we're really seeing this calf market pick up. And we're still, you know, we're still several weeks from grass, obviously. I, I'm guessing for most of us, probably almost two months, if I had to kind of guess, given how hard a lot of our pastures were likely, were likely grazed last year.
Last point I want to make as I start moving towards my forecast is just to make this point about, you know, what, what these feed prices do in these markets. And what I'm showing you on the right-hand side, there's some data out of Kansas State. This is their focus on feed yard data. And I'm just simply showing you this is their estimated feed cost per pound of gain on cattle that are finished. Notice January of 2021, the estimated feed cost per pound of gain was about 83 cents a pound. That steadily increased throughout 2021. The last data point that I have is for December of 2022, but that, that came in just under $1.40 a pound, so a significant increase. What that really does is that really incentivizes those feed yards to place heavier feeder cattle. I've said this many times. If you, if you heard me talk last, well, I, I think in the fall, I said something similar. But what we're seeing is, especially on these heavier cattle, not calves as much as heavier feeders, we're seeing those price slides narrow, which means that that value of gain is higher. There's a lot of incentive for us in Kentucky to add additional pounds to cattle before we sell them, whether that be on feed, whether that be on pasture. Now, I don't want to get into a stocker budget. I just want to make a point, all right? When I, when I got done today at the office and headed to the house this afternoon, this evening, the fall board, October, November, was like, you know, 214, 215. Okay, now, you know, using, you know, using a pretty conservative basis number, that should translate to a price in the fall of about $2 a pound for 850 pound steer. Now I can take that and I can make some assumptions about pasture cost. I've got 40 bucks in here for pasture maintenance. I've got 50 bucks for pasture rent. I've got mineral, I've got vet and medicine, I've got sale expense. I can walk through cost. By the way, notice I'm running interest at 8% now. I ran it at 4% this time last year, I think. I've got 2% death loss. The point that I wanna make is, I can plug two dollars and thirty-five cents into this budget, given a sale, you know, an assumed sale price of two bucks a pound for for fall, and I can still show a pretty darn strong return to a grazing program. And again, I'll point out that I've also got pasture rental rate right in there, and I've got interest in there. So this would be a strong summer stocker budget looking forward. Now, what I want to show you here quickly, and I, I do this quite a bit, this is just simply a sensitivity table. Okay, so what I showed you before was my assumed stocker budget, assuming a sale price for an eight weight of $2 a pound, and then a placement value this spring for that five weight steer at about $235, and the return would be about $137 per head. And I'm just going to fill out that column. So now what I'm showing you is, okay, how does that return change as the price of that 550-pound steer calf goes up? In a normal year, a normal stocker year, as we bid on those calves in the spring, and we'll do that when we start seeing grass rolling, we usually take that down somewhere between $50 and $100. Now, I don't know that we'll take it down that far this year. But the point that I want to make is there is a lot of room for this calf market to run and I still see some pretty attractive black ink going forward in these stocker operations. And it's going to be that those calves value when they're placed into those type of grazing programs this spring is going to determine how high those markets actually get. And again, making some assumptions about sale price, obviously there's some potential, I think, for as good a stocker year as we've seen in a very long time. This applies if I'm a stalker operator looking at buying calves this spring. If you're a fall calf or weaning calves in the spring, this same incentive applies to you if you think about, you know, growing those calves for a period of time on, on stockpile grass or, sorry, on, on spring pasture, or at least utilizing some of that before you clip it in the early summer to add some pounds. So I definitely would encourage you to think about that. Um, wrapping up here kind of with my thoughts on 2023, uh, I've said this before, although frankly, I've, I've increased my price forecast nominally. It'll be the best spring market we've seen since 2015. I think the state average price for that pound steer calf will be somewhere between 225 and 230. So that's about 30 cents higher state average than he was last week. If I'm right about that, you will see a lot of these higher quality groups, these value added groups of calves moving through yards, selling the 230s and probably 240s. There's always that much range on these calves, especially in the spring. So you know, we're going to see prices like we haven't seen in quite a while. We've also got a lot of carry on the board, meaning we've got a lot of carry in the feeder cattle futures market. There's about a 
around $28 a hundredweight difference in what the March Peter Cattle Futures contract is trading for versus the October, November, meaning that the expectation is these heavy feeder cattle prices get, you know, 20 to 25 to 30 dollars a hundredweight higher as we move through 2023. So, so Kenny's best guess for planning prices for you is those eight weight steers are in the 170s by the spring, 180s by summer, and 190s by fall. Ordinarily, they would peak sometime late summer, early fall. I think they're going to peak later this this year just simply due to tighter supplies. In other words, that that smaller calf crop that we're going to see in 2023 means supplies are going to be tighter than move through the year. Um, I'm going to end with just a couple of thoughts here that I've kind of been sharing with folks. And these are these are not market related as much as just general economic stuff that does tie to the market. But if I was talking to you in the fall, I would have talked about, you know, don't don't waste any pasture you have. And at this point, we've kind of shifted to this idea. Okay, let's let's not waste any hay that I've got. Um, I've honestly been a little bit surprised that hay prices haven't gotten higher than they have. Um, the hay auction out of Richmond, you know, you know, grass hay in roll bale form averaged about a hundred bucks a ton. Um, the one down in, uh, shoot, where was that? Monroe County, uh, kind of South Central Kentucky, averaged like 105, 110, something, 105, 110 a ton. So we've seen prices move up. But I would not be surprised, especially if we have a later spring. And again, I think because so many folks had to graze hard and they probably wanted to back last fall, we may see pasture a little late to come around. I think we could start to see folks scrambling for hay as we move into March and early April. I don't know that to be a fact. That's just my guess. So if that's the case, you know, you want to make sure you are you've, you've taken good, good inventory of your hay supplies and, and utilize as best you can what you got available. Secondly, think long term on breeding stock investment. Um, I, you know, I, I share this idea a lot when I talk to producers in county settings, but you know, the story here is don't chase prices, right? You know, my guess is we're going to see a much higher calf market, we're going to see a much higher uh, bred heifer market, and then there's a good reason for that. But again, if you want to add, you know, more breeding stock to herd, if you want to grow the size of your herd, don't do it because prices are high in 2023. Do it because you can make money on those heifers long term and think about them as the 8, 10, 12 year investments that they are. Um, you know, if you're a if you're a stocker op if you're a stocker operator or if you're a you know a feed-based backgrounder, don't don't fall victim to what I call sticker shock. You're, you're gonna pay a lot for feed and you're gonna pay a lot for, for calves this spring. But that in and of itself doesn't mean you can't make money adding weight to those calves because market dynamics have changed. So push the pencil. I think you'll find opportunity. You know, in the spring, certainly we think about grazing cattle. And honestly, you know, even a few weeks ago, as the calf market was moving up, I, I could still, you know, shake out some decent return to a feed-based program. So push the pencil, work through a budget, things are there. Last thing I'll say, you know, we've got more risk management tools than we've probably ever had at our disposal. And, you know, take advantage of those. Um, the market right now is offering us some pretty attractive prices. I've got a fall board, you know, 214, 215 for October, November. Folks, it's been a long time since I've had that opportunity. So there are ways that we can capitalize on that, whether that be forward contracting, futures and options. I love livestock risk protection insurance. So Use the tools that are available to you. We've got some things that are, we haven't had in the past that are now there at our fingertips. Two quick commercials and I'll stop talking. Um, next week, Mid-South Stalker Conference, February 21st and 22nd, the evening of the 21st, during the day of the 22nd. I'm looking forward to being part of this program again. It's been a while since I have been, so you'll, you'll learn a lot there. And I'm really looking forward to being in Bowling Green next week. Also want to pitch some some economic related programming that I'm working with uh, two of my colleagues, Greg Hallett and Jonathan Shepard on, but we're gonna do a series of background and stocker profitability conferences in a few different locations. We'll be in Fayette County on the 24th, Derrick County on the 28th and Hardin County on the 1st. And these will be focused solely on economics, budgeting and risk management for background and stocker operations. If you don't get cattle market notes, we'd like to send it to you every Monday afternoon. I'm proud of what we've done there. This night goes out to over 1,300 people directly, and that doesn't count listservs and forwards and things like that. So I've got 1,360 some email addresses this goes out to. So we, we would love to grow that, and we'll take as many as we can get on. So sign up for that. Um, I will stop sharing there, and I will 
look forward to hearing what Dr. Lindbluer has got to say. Thank you very much, Kenny. So uh, as Dr. Lim Cooler starts getting his ready to share, I've got a quick question for you or uh, kind of a discussion, I guess. I love when an economist talks about breeding stock and some strategies along that line. I, my thought on that, Kenny, is, is um, in a lot of cases, what folks need to be doing in terms of like keeping back heifers and things like that is kind of the opposite of maybe what everybody else is doing. Um, because like you say, that everybody tends to focus on the now market and they see those high prices and they say, well, I got to expand. Well, that's probably not the time to expand, right? Uh, the time to expand is, is when you can uh, maybe uh, at, at the other end of that market. Any quick comments on that? That's a good concept. And of course, you know, the, the difficulty in that is there's there's some time lag between when I start you know holding back heifers and actually see no more calves to sell. So to be opposite whatever folk what other folks are doing, I've got to almost be thinking ahead, which is sometimes a challenge. But there's there's no question that if if I could be growing my herd as others are contracting and then the opposite, I, I should have more calves to sell when they're higher and fewer when they're lower. One concept I'll mention that was that was looked at several years ago, Dr. Bullock was. Um, colleague of mine out of Iowa State, he kind of said, here's kind of a middle of the road approach. He said, rather than thinking about, you know, a number of heifers to develop each year for replacement, he said, think about a dollar value. So whatever that number is, maybe I allocate, I don't know, you know, $20,000 a year, given the size of my herd for heifer development. And what that'll do automatically is when they're more expensive, when those heifer calves are more valuable, that dollar, those dollars don't buy quite as many. And then when they're cheaper, it buys more. And that's one way to kind of move us towards that concept you're talking about, about being opposite the market. So kind of a neat concept to think about. Think about almost a dollar cost averaging fixed heifer development approach number, as opposed to just kind of thinking about chasing prices, which unfortunately some folks do. That's a good thought, Kenny. Thanks for that. All right, to keep things moving, and, and uh, Dr. Burdine said he will stick around for some questions at the end, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Jeff Limcooler, uh, and I'm excited to see where he's found all this cheap feed, and I'm sure he's going to send all you guys there. So, Dr. Limcooler, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. Can you hear me all right? Absolutely. All right. So, um one of the things that I wanted to go through this evening was uh, to kind of share some of the trends that are going on. And it's important to kind of keep in the back of our mind why feed prices are the way they are. And this top graph up here is showing the relationship between the corn price that's paid at uh, and the Iowa ethanol plants and the price of dried distillers grains that are marketed up outside. And I want to drive home this point that our commodity prices for corn and, and soybeans are going to drive our feed prices. And so if we go back all the way to 2016, when corn was around 335 to three and a half a bushel, uh, you can see here by the, the red line, uh, which is the corn price, and the blue line, which is the dry distiller's grains prices, that these track pretty much hand in hand. Uh, and it should make some sense to us as we think about what happens, um, you know, as an ethanol plant is buying corn at a higher price, they're going to try to recover some of that cost through the marketing of the dry distillers grains. And also because these feed prices are, are these feedstuffs are interchangeable anymore, um, they do tend to be kind of locked in with with one another and i'll just give you a, a quick example um you know about 20 years ago or so whenever we were pre-ethanol boom number two a, a traditional feedlot ration would be one one and a half percent urea seven to to nine percent alfalfa hay and and then the remainder would be steam flaked corn today today when we look at the um kind of feedlot rations, most of them are using some varying level of, of, of commodity feedstuffs coming out of either a gluten plant or a distiller's type of a byproduct. And that might be 20 to 30% inclusion rates. And so um, 
you know, because of the energy value in dry distillers grains being very similar to corn, they're interchangeable. And so the demand for these co-products is pretty high now because a lot of cattle are on feed or are using these co-product feeds. And so you can just see that relationship. And then if we jump down to this next one, uh, it, the chart here, basically down here to 100 percent, that means that the distillers and corn price is exactly the same price per ton, if you will. And this just covers more states, Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, South Dakota, Wisconsin. And you can see that there are opportunities and times where we begin to see the, the price of distillers grains here, for example, being much higher than the price of corn. And so that would be one of those reasons why we might shift um, and look at other feed alternatives if gluten feed might be a little cheaper or even in some situations, some of the alternative proteins like maybe NPN or non-protein nitrogen uh, if it's cost competitive and, and works into the ration. And then you see a little blip here in, in kind of the impact of COVID and this ties directly back to what I mentioned a while ago with regards to the demand for these co-products and when the ethanol plants uh, were shut down for a short period of time. It, you can't just switch all these cattle that are on feed um, using this feed stuff to the older diets um, overnight because of the increased level of starch that's going to come in from uh, corn. And so that did kind of put a blip in demand. And so that uh, certainly increased uh, price because of the limit in supply. But now I, I want you to see when we're getting back out here um, into kind of um, kind of end of the year in 2022, we were beginning to see distillers grains prices come down below the, that of the price of corn. And so I think if you look at some of the elevator prices too, you're going to find that distillers grains are relatively competitively priced in comparison to other feeds like corn gluten feed. Um, and, and it will not be too much higher than maybe corn. And so that gives us the opportunity to, to shift um, feedstuffs that we might be using. Now, every week, USDA puts out some feedstuff price reports and those feedstuffs are at the processing plant where, um, you know, wheat's going to be processed for flour and where beans are going to be processed for soy oil and, and soybean meal. So keep that in the back of your mind that these prices are not what you're going to pay for at the local feed store or, or elevator. But I wanted you to kind of see the relationship here and, and some of the energy values and some of the protein values. Because we use corn and soybean meal as kind of gold standards for the price of energy in relationship to corn and the price of protein in relationship to soybean meal, um, these prices are going to kind of be reflective of the energy and the protein that um, these different feedstuffs may have. And then also, as we think about prices, don't overlook that, you know, we might look at um, a feed stuff and say, well, it's relatively inexpensive, uh, like rice meal feed here as an example. Uh, but in comparison, it's not that high in crude protein. Most of your all's hay is going to test higher than 7% uh, crude protein. And it's relatively low in energy at 39%. Um, you know, this is actually, we, you know, probably lower than what wheat straw from, a, from an energy standpoint would come in. We usually would say in the upper 30s to low 40s for wheat straw. So it, it is relatively cheap at $65 a ton. Uh, but then you've got to pay trucking and freight and get it from Arkansas or Louisiana up here. And that gets it to be priced pretty high with regards to the, the nutrient content. And so if you go to your feed meal or your feed dealer and say, I need cheaper feed stuff, just be cautious and be careful of what you're asking for, because we can get some of these lower quality feed stuffs in at a lower price. Doesn't mean that you're going to really get the value that you're hoping for. And, and I just want you to kind of come down through here and, and look at these prices and they all tend to be trending about the same. Now, based off of um, uh, prices that were, this actually should say February the 10th. Sorry about that. I updated these. Um, and prices did drop about $25 to $30 a ton on average for most things. Um, soybean meal would be kind of the exception. 
and hominy came down a little bit, but not a whole lot. But uh, most of these feed prices are are beginning to trend down a little bit as the corn market begins to come down some. So um, what is the potential for cheap feed? And, and I want to echo this. Trust me, Dr. Burdine and I didn't talk about this beforehand. Um, but as you begin looking on maybe some local hay markets, uh, don't overlook the potential to buy in hay. Um, because there is certainly some opportunities and, and you can see some different prices here on marketplace anywhere from $55 a row to $30 a row. Um, and if you get down here and you look, look right here, here's the value, right? This is the bargain of the night. Everybody get ready to get on Facebook at $18 a row. Um, but I, I just want you to kind of not overlook that a lot of these hay markets are very localized because of the package. It's hard to stack round bales on tractor trailers and you can't get as many onto a semi as you can large square bales. And so that market becomes a little bit more regional. And, and then I want to jump back in here. This is pictures of that $18 a roll A and uh, not sure that there's much value there. And those rolls are, um, you know, pretty well rotted and there's a lot of rot even in, inside that even deeper um and versus this hay down here that the price was thirty dollars a row 120 big rows barn kept the elderly lady sold out her cattle and no longer needs the hay so sure it's much higher in price uh but you're going to get a better value for this hay uh, because it's been stored inside and and you've not got you know a two-thirds half to two-thirds of the bale it's that's pretty well rotted so I wanted to just quickly run through and show you some examples of when we price these feedstuffs out on a nutrient basis. And here I've got a, uh, just a spreadsheet that we use to look at kind of feedstuffs and the cost per unit of TDN. Dr. Van Valen and I always try to make sure that we talk to people about pricing alternatives based on a nutrient content. And so here we're just going to look and say, all right, what's our cheapest unit of energy or cheapest calorie source potential? And I've got fescue hay in here at $45 a row for a four by five that might weigh 750 pounds. Corn priced in here at three and a quarter a ton. Soy hulls at 345 a ton. Corn silage um, at $75 a ton as is with a 35% dry matter basis. And then not a really good corn silage. Um, well, not a bad corn silage at 73 TDN. That's pretty well average on the energy content. Dry distillers grains here at three and a quarter. And then I threw stillage in here at 10 cents a gallon. Um, that's the nine pound unit weight here is about a gallon. That's pretty close to what stillage is going to weigh. And um, when we begin looking at these, then the, the green means it's the cheap, kind of the cheaper side. Um, and then as we move to orange and red, they begin to get more expensive when we look at cost per unit of energy. And, you know, hay is still going to be one of our lowest potential priced feeds, you know, and at $45, um, that's still going to come in at, at close to 110, maybe $120 a ton. When you make the adjustment here for this being a 750 pound bale, so it's going to run you about $120 a ton. And Dr. Burdine was telling you the markets have been 100 to 105 at the uh, Richmond and and the other sales. So the the take home message, I guess I would say, is is don't overlook this local hay market opportunity, um, and and then also don't overlook the the possibility of maybe buying hay to to build up stocks if you're a little bit low and if it's been barn kept, you can put it back in the barn, and um, it it'll keep its nutrient quality for quite some time. Corn silage is one of these that, it, you know, I've priced this um, relatively high. I think um, I've shared some of the Iowa uh, corn silage market, uh, or sorry, corn silage production budgets. And and it's somewhere around the $55 to $60 a ton range is what they're predicting for 2023 on corn silage. So if you're a backgrounder or you're a, a, a large enough operation that you can take advantage of corn silage, it, it still tends to be one of our 
cost effective uh, energy sources for feeding uh, stockers and, and supplementing cows some energy through the winter. How do the same thing here with protein and, and I've got grass hay in here and I've got stillage, corn gluten feed, soybean meal, distillers grains, and then a 24% protein tub. Uh, the one thing I'll just make comment on the protein tubs, this tub would have been about a 50 or $55 um, tub previously, but with inflation and input costs going up, uh, you can see that that price now is about $75 uh, for a 250 pound tub. And as we look then at the quote unquote most economical protein source, stillage comes in here as a as a low cost opportunity here for us thinking about protein supplement. And understand this is this is at 10 cents a gallon. And so you may be getting it much cheaper than that. Um, but I don't want to also overlook the potential of transportation cost, handling cost. And those other issues that come along with handling a feed that's 92% um, water. So you need to kind of keep those issues and things in the back of your mind. But then we jump down here and, and again, dry distillers grains at $325 a ton becomes our next uh, lowest cost option from a cost per pound of protein uh, when we've got gluten feed at, at $300 a ton. And again, you need to do your shopping around and find out what your local feed prices are going to be. Um, but then, you know, here I just want to point out that on the tub, you're you're really paying for that convenience, and um, it's a dollar sixty four for each pound of of protein that's in that tub. But don't overlook that, you know, the the cost of diesel and fuel and all that is pretty high now, and your time is worth something. And Dr. Halich and I did a, a spreadsheet a few years ago looking at uh, the, the value of, of using a tub and uh, going down every day to check on cattle and, and supplement cattle versus using a free choice tub and only going down once a, once a week to look at things. And you know, in, in our analysis back then when fuel was much cheaper, once you get to that point of traveling about 30 miles to get to a farm, uh, these protein tubs begin to become more cost effective uh, because of the higher fuel cost and, and time to go down and, and check on things and or feed things. Uh, but if you're really close and the cattle are at home, uh, it is much more expensive than some of the alternatives that you'd have, even, even considering soybean meal at $650 a ton if you just really need to supplement uh, protein to the cows to, to meet their requirements. Now, I want to just carefully come back and say, watch the good buys. And uh, if you look at some of these feedstuffs here, fescue hay, corn stalks, uh, bean stove or wheat straw, soy hulls, rice hulls, and peanut hulls, as feed prices got high in uh, 08, 09, uh, we began to see some of these Southern feedstuffs like rice hulls and peanut hulls make their way up here. And, um, you know, they're higher in NDF. Um, they're extremely high as an example in acid detergent fiber, which is that indigestible kind of cell wall fraction. And uh, what we begin to see then, and even in comparison to something like corn stalks and, and soybean stover, the digestibility of these feedstuffs are relatively poor in the rumen because they're a very small particle size that can wash out of the rumen relatively quickly and they are relatively high in, in ADF. And so uh, we really don't get much value from a feed uh, standpoint out of these. And there's a reason why they're priced so cheaply. So just be cautious on what a good buy is. And then to kind of speed the, through a few things, I wanted to share some alternatives and performance. These are some nice work that uh, Noble Foundation did out in Oklahoma, looking at stalker cattle receiving um, the same amount of supplement, but either dry distillers, grains, corn gluten feed, soybean hulls, barley malt pellets, which we won't see here much. That's more of kind of that Dakota area and, and Minnesota where they grow barley for malting. And then thinking about wheat mids. And you can see that performance because of the higher oil content, it's going to have a little more energy. Um, the, the distillers grains that are full oil little bit better performance in gluten feed and soybean hulls. But today, 
we've got oil that is being extracted from the distiller's grain. So that feeding value may come down here and kind of level this playing field out a little bit more. But our bourbon distiller's grains are still full oil. And so um, I suspect uh, that they would still be up in this range. Dr. Van Zant did a little bit of a study out at the the little research station a few years ago comparing fuel ethanol and bourbon distillers grains at 1% of body weight on some stockers on fescue. He didn't see any performance difference uh, between the sources of uh, fuel ethanol or, or bourbon distillers. So there, there is that opportunity for us to, to find and, and utilize those uh, here locally. I like this study that John Waller did. Um, John was at, at UT and he did a 90% corn, 10% cottonseed product fed to cattle that were receiving rye baleage, which would be relatively good quality forage. And everything was fed at four pounds per head per day. And when you look at this 90% corn, 10% cottonseed meal, dry distillers grains did give you, give you about two tenths of a pound a day gain bump. And this is again, just at four pounds a supplement. And it was better uh, than corn gluten feed. And then as you look at the 50-50 the mix or two pounds of distillers and two pounds of gluten feed, uh, they didn't quite come back. And so to me, this kind of clearly indicates that it was an energy supplement response that we were seeing here uh, with the distillers grains. And that again is gonna be due to that higher oil content because you know, oil or fat has, you know, almost twice the amount of caloric value as, as fiber was going to. I wanted to share some of this work that Dr. Van Zant and um, uh, one of his graduate students did looking at supplementing dry distillers grains on fescue pastures. The, the controls are here at 0% of body weight. And then these numbers down at the bottom represent a percent of body weight supplementation. So if you've got a, a 600 pound steer here at 1% of body weight, that's equal to six pounds of dry distillers grains. And they were looking for trying to reach at, at what point do we kind of stop seeing a response to supplement with dry distillers grains. And then the first year you can see it was pretty, pretty much a linear response that as you supplemented with more dry distillers grains up to 1% of body weight, the cattle just continued to perform better. And then the next year, they went out to even higher rates, up to 1.6% of body weight. And again, the linear trend, as we increased um, the supplement rate, the cattle tended to do better. And then when we got up here, um, really took a pretty big jump. Now, realize and appreciate that there was significant difference in forage quality and, and availability in, in the years. So these cattle were gaining 2.1 on no supplement, 1.7 over here but still the same response is seen. So that gives you maybe a visual or an idea that these feedstuffs can be used and, and improve our performance on, on pasture. And when we got high prices and, or as Dr. Burdine mentioned, maybe some slower rebounding pastures here in the spring, uh, the, that supplement on pasture can reduce forage intake. Then you're also bringing in some nitrogen when we're feeding maybe more than we need to. They're going to urinate that out, and that can be a, a source of potential nitrogen if it's not vol all volatilized. But we probably get 70 to 80 percent of the or the urea being uh, volatilized to ammonia. We we lose that, but there's still going to be a residual amount that goes in to help boost that grass. This is some work that Matt Poor's grad student did looking at heifers, and I just want to quickly run through this. Uh, this is uh, kind of heifers receiving uh, three pounds a day supplement on average across the group here in either corn gluten feed, soybean hulls, or a one-to-one -one mix, which we'd call that, you know, that 50-50 blend. And, and you can see if they're just on fescue pasture, performance was about seven-tenths of a pound a day through the winter. This was on the stockpile kind of fescue um, and just three pounds on average supplement boosted these heifers up pretty significantly. And there really wasn't any difference. So that tells us that it was kind of an energy response. We jump and look at the different amounts of supplement given. And so at half percent up to one and a half percent or, or three pounds, six pounds or nine pounds of supplement. And you can see that these calves, these replacement heifers responded as they received more supplement gains got up pretty high. 
But perhaps the most important thing is this kind of concept where a little dab will do you. Pregnancy rates really were not different at all at 100% if you went from three to six to nine. And they were significantly better than the heifers that were not supplemented at 79%. So um, again, we've always tried to mention this, that these young heifers that are developing, we need to keep them in a positive energy balance and, and meet that energy requirement if we really want to optimize reproductive success. And then uh, I wanted to switch to kind of a quick alternative that I really haven't hit much on, and that's wheat mids. Um, and, and this work was uh, done in, in Canada. And I, I like this just as an example for some of our backgrounder folks that are in the audience. The diet is 55% corn silage and then either 40% corn dry distillers grains, 40% wheat dry distillers grains, or 40% wheat mids. And if you look at the performance, uh, you can see that we did see a bump as we as we came in here and, and we brought in um, either protein supplement. And, and what we were doing here is swapping out corn as an example. So 40% corn came out. And, and we've seen a nice kind of response here um, by possibly improving protein balance and then also reducing the starch load going in the room. And, um, feed efficiencies really weren't different across the board here. And so really, as you look at these, you know, all of these have the opportunity to come in here and be used in these corn silage diets as a protein source and also as an energy source um, and, and think about our opportunities to exchange feeds. We do have a, a wheat processing plant in Hopkinsville, the Seamers plant there, and they do produce wheat mids. So um, that's just another alternative feed that we maybe don't think about sometimes. Uh, we talk a lot about gluten and soy hulls, but um, I wanted to share a little bit of, of data here on wheat mids since we do have a plant in the state. So in conclusion, uh, there's a, a lot of co-products that we can use um, and, and switch in and out and maintain performance. Uh, it's important that we price these out on a nutrient content basis and, and then think about the goal on the level of performance that we need out of that feed stuff. Large number of, of combinations are out there, but please be sure to work with your nutritionist or your county agent or, or one of us to try to get a balanced diet to make sure that we're not inducing deficiencies. Um, particularly when we're going with high amounts of corn-based feeds like corn silage and using corn gluten or, or corn distillers grains, we can easily cause an imbalance of calcium and phosphorus, which can be problematic and lead to urinary stones. Um, and then lastly, I, I just wanted to kind of say that if you look at the corn futures, it, it is trending downward. And as you get into... Um, kind of the fall and in December of next year, we're, we're looking at, you know, the, the board being right now at $5. So if you remember that relationship between distillers grains and corn price, you know, I think my projection would be that as we move through the, the year, if everything holds true and what the futures market is telling us that we should see some relief um, on some of the feed prices as we move through the year. And that would bode well if we look at Kenny's, um, kind of market projections on on the, the potential to see 190 type prices in the fall. So I would agree with him. Don't don't think that it's all doom and gloom. There seems there seems to be some good opportunities yet to, to find some profitability in the in the cattle market. Um, my feeling still is when we look at it, forage is often our cheapest feed stuff. And, and here I'm going to throw corn silage in here as well. And so let's maximize the utilization of that. And I would say work with, you know, your extension agent and, and uh, Dr. Henning and others to think about how can we rebound um, these pastures and get as, you know, as good a productivity as we possibly can afford and think about split applica application on fertilizers and really stretching that fertilizer value. Um, and then lastly, be careful when you're switching around on feeds that you don't induce some digestive upsets and, and make sure that we change these feed stuffs, particularly when we're bouncing from um, kind of low starch rations to higher starch rations. Let's just be careful that we don't do this immediately and cause some problems. And, and this is that real quick, that associative kind of response. If we're, we're thinking about intakes of forage here and we don't have any supplement 
and we go in now and we give some supplement. If we have no response on that, it's just intake goes up by the amount of supplement that we give. If we give a, a supplement that causes a reduction in fiber digestion, then we're going to see forage intake go down. And so this would be our classic overfeeding of starch response. And then here, a positive associative effect would be a classic uh, response to protein supplement when we were maybe in a protein limiting diet, like in uh, some, oh, well, let's say corn stalks or something like that, that are only running 6% five, 6% protein, and we give a little bit of protein supplement and fiber digestion goes up. So now the cattle can actually eat a little bit more forage. So we, we want to play around with those supplements and make sure that they work out for us. And I've already kind of covered all this. So I'm just going to skip here at the end and just say, don't overlook the potential on transportation and handling costs on these things, because stillage is a hot item right now. And I'm not going to spend any time on that this evening, but there are a lot of costs that come along with that, and we need to make sure that we understand what those costs are. It is a good opportunity to lower our feed costs, but let's just be cognizant of, of the other issues that come along with those. And uh, here's some other things you can get out of your county extension office for some of these pubs that we've got listed here, and they can print those out, or you can jump online and, and find these pubs, um, some of these different feed stuffs. So with that, Dr. Bullock, I'm going to turn it back over to you and um, I'm sure we can entertain a few questions. Absolutely. That's great information. You guys have lifted my spirits tonight. Every, I, was, I was in the doom and gloom mode, so uh, it's good to hear there's some opportunities. I guess while people are thinking about it, if you would, folks, uh, if you have a question for either of these gentlemen, please type them in the chat. Um, or in a little bit, I'll give you some time if you want to unmute and ask it that way you can. But to get things kind of started, Jeff, um, I have a particular situation I want to ask you about uh, due to the timing that we're going into. We're, we're getting into calving season and we have, you know, we have folks that have been putting a ton of genetics into their cattle from a growth standpoint, milking ability standpoint. Um, and they've got these first calf heifers that they just had their first calf. And I know what people tend to do is once they've had their calf, she's officially a cow. And she goes in with the rest of the cows. Uh, we treat her good up to that point. But then we kind of dump her with the rest of the cows a lot of times. What's your thoughts on that? Do we need to be providing those girls with a little more nutrition and, and, and not just throw them to the wolves right after they've had that first calf? Uh, Dr. Bullock, that's a great question. And, and I think Dr. Anderson, you know, he'll tell us too, that those kind of those first calf heifers are, are and the, even the next um, kind of these, as we go in and they have that second calf, they can be a bit challenging to get bred back because they do get into a negative energy balance um, when they go into that lactation and we're breeding more milk into them, even if we're not maybe intentionally selecting for more milk as, as you've told us that genetic trend for milk tends to be going up Um so we are probably in a situation where right now, as an example, where we might be dropping some heifers and, and having them calve and they're still on, on hay and it's not going to be high enough to meet their nutritional quality or, and they're going to pull those stores and muscle and fat's going to be pulled down because they're in that negative energy balance. And we, I mean, there's decades and decades of research that shows that as we move into negative energy balance, um, these heifers don't breed back as well, or these first calf cows don't breed back as well as if we maintain their nutrient intake, then we maintain body condition scores. The From the time they calf to the time that we turn that bull in, the, that's how we really optimize that reproductive success. So absolutely, we want to make sure and keep, keep them on a good nutritional plane. And Dr. Burdine can probably tell us, but you know, that depreciation value, bred heifers are $1,800 to $2,000, maybe more. And, and if she doesn't breed back uh, and you sell her as a pound cow, that's a pretty high amount of depreciation. I think there was a question, Dr. Burdine, for you. Yep. 
So uh, sorry, I was on mute again. Uh, I don't know if you see it there, Kenny, but Dr. Burdine, can you give the information on when you will be in Fayette County again? Thanks. Yeah, the program in Fayette County is the 24th, so it's next Friday. Um, and again, reach out to your county agent, just call Fayette County office to register for that. But we'll be there on Friday the 24th, and that program will be 930, and we'll go to about uh, 2, 230, something like that. So all-day program, all economics, everybody's dream, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Just, thanks. Yeah, Bo just... Uh, Bo, the Fayette County agent, just chimed in and said $15 registration to cover the meal. So that's funded by the Ag Development Board that, you know, they're funding the program, the materials, and so forth. But the, the $15 covers your meal that day. So thank you, Bo. Appreciate it, buddy. Dr. Burdine, have you ran costs on the, the increase in annual cow costs compared to, say, two years ago or a year ago? <laughs> Yeah, really, I'll credit Greg. He's the one that, that kind of did it based on the fertilizer prices. But looking at, you know, if in, in a normal situation, uh, pasture maintenance and hay cost, I believe his estimate was about $150, $200 a gal, which is a mind boggling number, right? Now, there's things I can do to maybe lessen that amount. But if I just kind of assumed I use the same basic forage program, you know, 2020 versus 2022, about 150 bucks a cow, I think was his estimate. Yeah, and that I think I had figured about two, about one eighty to two hundred. Yeah. So, um, but but when I look at the potential in the feeder calf market, it's it's offsetting that, and so uh, I see that we're we're going to make that back up and could even exceed that difference. All right, folks. Uh, if anybody has any questions, like I say, put them in the chat if you would, or if you would prefer to ask it. Uh, you can unmute if you if I ask you if you do unmute, state your name and let me call on you and, and then we'll go from there. But if anybody has a question, uh, you can unmute and, and state your name, please. Everybody's ready to get back to their Valentine's. Well, I, I know I, I do appreciate that everybody are uh, as, as poor as I am with their romanticness i guess <laughs> we're, we're, we're all on here uh ed getting ourselves educated tonight but uh that's all right that's right i, I do want to make this one last comment um so the the mid-south stalker conference people can um register up to the day of the event but we'd really like folks to pre-register so we can do the meal counts but um if you're unsure you, you're welcome just to show up and, and pay the day um, of the event Jeff, I, I actually had a, another quick question for you. I, I'm I'm curious, um, and I think everybody else sees it too. We 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 see all these uh, new bourbon distilleries going in everywhere and and everything. What what do you kind of see as the future with with some of that? Do people need to start taking that a little more seriously? Kind of kind of what's your opinion on that? Oh, open the cameras. <laughs> um, it's Sorry. a great local feed source for us. Um, it, it's some of the, the smaller distilleries, like the, the true craft distilleries that are relatively small. Um, I think that that will continue to be a local source um for for farmers and it may be you know a thousand gallons a week to two thousand gallons a week um the the others that are larger there has my understanding just as an example is that jack daniels put in a biodigester so it's my understanding that they're separating out the grains to make your wet distillers grains or wet cake that we would often hear it called and then that thin stillage that would normally go to an evaporator to make syrup is going into the di digester. Um, and, and there is additional research, even in, if I look in the research um, on kind of small scale test models and that, there's been a tick up in research looking at biodigesters to try and handle some of this um, because we're not the only ones that are seeing this. It, uh, Irish whiskey is is another big, um, another big kind of 
oh, spirit that's seen a great increase like bourbon and, and they're dealing with the same challenges of getting rid of the, the feed. And so that's a potential. There's research right now too, looking at activated charcoal. Um, the, the feed stock seems to be a good feed stock to make activated charcoal for water filters and other things like that. Um, and so that might be a potential uh, opportunity in the future as well. And the larger distilleries um, that have the capacity to put in a dryer, I think as, as um, we continue to see increased growth of livestock, or, or let me back up, as we see increased growth for, for animal protein across you know, the world, um, there could potentially be a value added back. And so if you can dry that, you can put it on a barge or on a ship and, and move it. You can put it on a rail and move it and store it. And so as that demand increases and the opportunity to build more profitability and to dry it, um, I think the larger distilleries will continue to dry more of it. Sorry, didn't 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 mean to hit it hit the the sore spot, but no, uh, it's not uh, a sore spot. No, it, I I understand. A a can of worms, I guess. Yeah, but, it's it's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge that we need to think about and face. But it's it is a good opportunity for us because it is a local feed stuff that can lower our production costs, and um, there are some ways that we can feed more of it than we maybe what I would normally recommend if we do some adjustments on it and that and take advantage of it to um, maybe even finish out more cattle here. And and you have the fact sheet on that. So people are can certainly, if they're uh, want some more information, can go that route too. Yep. And let's see, there was a question that came in when you buy bulk feed and what time frame should you feed it out before it starts to lose protein? Uh, ben, that's a good question. It it won't typically lose any nutritional value as long as you keep it dry and you don't have any mold growth in that one. And I know this sounds silly, but that's one of the challenges we have. Even, even when we store corn in the grain bin on the farm, because we have so much humidity in in this region, you got to turn the fans on every so often just to kind of get some air exchange through there and and keep the corn dry. So um, it it can be stored for a relatively long time in this kind of weather through the winter. Um, we don't, you know, the colder it is, the drier the air is and the less humidity you have. When we move into the spring and you start getting more moisture in the air, that feed will want to suck up some of that moisture. Not a lot, but it'll suck up some and you'll notice maybe it'll start clumping up and sticking um, so you don't necessarily lose value per se as much as you begin to get some mold moldiness. And then the concern is, is, is that mold going to start causing some mycotoxins? So um, I don't know if Dr. Henning's still on, but I think Dr. Henning tested some hay that was like 20 or 25 years old that was stored in a barn and, and the nutritional value on that hay was still extremely good. Excellent. All right. Um, do we have any last minute speak now or forever hold your peace? And I'm going to let everybody go to their loved ones for this happy Valentine's Day. Hearing or seeing none, I do want to thank our speakers, Dr. Burdine, Dr. Lim Cooler again, and also thank Dr. Van Valen for her expert Facebook live productions and uh, we thank everybody for coming. We hope to see you guys in one month from today uh, for our beef management update. We'll have several of the specialists on that'll give an update uh, in their particular area uh, kind of going into the, that will be our last one until the fall. And so we'll try and uh, give you some great education to tide you over until the fall. And so we hope you'll join us then uh, for that session. And if you have some questions or discussions, uh, you can shoot me an email or just bring them to the table that evening. And we'll be happy to try and get to those as well. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thanks to our speakers. And you guys have a great night and a great week. See you later. Thanks, Dr. Bullock.